Hello everyone! Hello! <laughs> How's Hello. Life? Hello, welcome back. Uh, this is uh, the second of this uh, little videos. Our little um, reaction to having survived each Saw film. <laughs> Yes. So today we watched Saw 2 about, mm -hmm. I would say, a week, a week and a bit after we watched the first one. Yeah. Uh, I think that's kind of saving us. I don't think we could do these, watch one, review it, then watch the next one, then review it. I think that would really be a task, actually, to watch them. It would get too kind of tedious. We'd be too confused about what happened in what film as well. So I think, I guess so. I think we're going about this the right way. Yeah. What do you guys think? Yeah, I think, well, obviously watching all of them and then reviewing them would have been impossible. Yeah, I know, yeah. Uh, but we're uh, actually, yeah, we had a week, but we'll have just one day in between uh, the next mm -hmm. ones. Yeah, that's true. Which I think could work also. But <laughs> clearly it's better to do one and then the episode, but one and mm. then because it's, it, it will get confusing very quickly, even for a single, single film anyway. Mm. Right. Um, I actually really enjoyed the, this film. So I thought that I wouldn't, because I've I've seen it quite recently, and I thought I'd be like, oh god, not this film again. But actually, it's quite clever. Yeah, it's still it's still got its freshness to it. It doesn't feel like it's outworn its stay just yet. Yeah, and the poetics are truly in effect this time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> finally, we they're shattering. <laughs> it's soon to come, but yeah, we've. They eventually got around to it. Not bad for a space of doing it within, well, less than a year, because it would have come out 2004, the, no, 2001, sorry, the, was, no, it does right, 2004, for the, the first film, and this yeah. film is 2005, Five. so that's less than a year to make a film, because by the time it came out, it has to get up and start pre-production, yeah. that's less than a year. I, yeah, I saw an interview with Tobin Bell saying it started in 2003, but that's obviously when the initial production started. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The release, the dates, uh, the release dates are the ones we use mm. uh, right, right, right. every time. Yeah, of course. To simplify, yes. So, I mean, they obviously have like a bigger budget, they have a, uh, more, they probably have a lot more people involved in it as well. Yeah, So there true. are more like minds that can come together and like, you know, any plot holes or like can be looked over. That's true. Um, so, because so, there's quite a lot of stuff going on and there's like quite a big cast and um, just the kind of story is quite complicated. Yeah, it's getting there. So, um, yeah, so are we, we feeling on a scale of one to ten? Are we ready to discuss and carry on? Yes, uh, the question you asked in the first bit uh, that we did this one... Was it in we, no, the, no, the previous one, you asked if this one enticed us to watch the following one. So is this, that was in this, not the podcast, I forgot. No, that was in that thing. Alright, so yeah, that's the question I'm asking. Now, you, you ready? Would you watch the next one? Yes. Okay. Yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Alright. Mm -hmm. I too. would, but I'd be really... If I hadn't seen any of them, I'd be really worried that... Now it would just become a cash grab. Yeah, three like is the always. First two is usually okay, and then it just gets worse and worse. Usually, usually in a franchise, but so I'd be worried, but I still watch it. Yeah. Yeah, but and you also get to because you you can you get to wonder okay so what happens now with those uh, new mm. with these new elements how can it develop and stuff. Yeah. Right, true. and and if he uh, get, actually gets saved. Yeah. And all that stuff. That's actually yeah, yeah. something that, you know, I was wondering that, that is that what the next film is about? That, he, you know, he finds a way out and stuff like that? Or is he completely forgotten and they just move on? Like in the first one, we don't ever hear until then. And it's like, oh shit, okay, so he actually just, they just left him to die, literally. <laughs> <laughs> it's really fucked up. I know. Um, yeah, so yeah. So we shall see you soon when we record the episode and release it to you. And we'll also see you very soon when we're reacting to watching the next one. So yes. <laughs> yes. Until then. Until then. Sit still, my soul. <laughs> Yori says hi again. Oh. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Hello. Hi. Uh, as you can see in the background, if you watch the video, today is about Saw 2. Mm -hmm. Yes, we're on to the next one. I <laughs> uh, hope you enjoyed our review of the first movie and are eagerly awaiting 
us discussing Saw 2 and the trend that it now sets. Uh, Adam, it was your idea, so I have some notes, but still, you have I, the floor. I will be driving us forward on this voyage of <laughs> gruesomeness. Um, right, so, in the last episode, we briefly touched upon the whole hostile and uh, torture porn aspect that Saw kind of introduced. However, it's not totally present in the first film, because it's we barely see, we see like maybe two or three traps, and then the whole escape the room that really set up Saw. Um, however, this is the first film that starts off a trend for every other Saw movie that we will watch, which is the opening trap scene, which in this film is Michael and the infamous Venus fly trap. Um, so I'd like to open the floor. How do we feel for an open for an opening of a film? Well, uh, there's something I don't know if um if I talked about that in the first one. Um, if people were just to wait and think and not just jump forward, that um, wire that actually triggers the trap. Oh, of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's <laughs> well, the same in the first film. Amanda, when Amanda gets out of the chair, she pulls the pin on the on the reverse bear trap as well. Ah, uh, uh, but what would you rather? Panic and so let something happen, or just starve to death? Because it's not like Tobin Bell would have come to save you. You I, would just stay there forever. No, but I mean, yeah, you you think, well, the, the thing also is that we talked about that in some other episodes. Uh, namely, we started with that thing you do, like when you're in, in under pressure and you, you are a fan of someone, you, you don't think properly. So obviously they wouldn't think uh, properly and they would. I would probably do the same as I he think, did. I think you know by that point if you're going to, like, do it or not. Like... In your mind, if you wake up in that room, you're either going to do it or you're not going to do it. There's a big thing that, because in the first film, they get six hours. They get a hell of a long time to cut their own feet off and figure out how to escape the room. This guy gets 60 seconds. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Gonna go on, Jan. Yeah, I would... Uh, so, yeah, I probably... Uh, yeah, I probably, probably would react like he did, but if you, it depends on the, if you're a Cartesian kind of guy or if you're uh, you have um, Buddhist uh, principles, <laughs> you would probably just <laughs> wait and uh, try to analyze, which would probably have worked uh, for him. But 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 um, uh, what? Mm? Hello. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Hi, it's us. Did that make a difference? A, bit, a yeah. bit. Yeah. Okay, um, I'm just thinking that I if he didn't start the timer, then the game hasn't begun. Correct. But doesn't that mean that he would just starve to death with that thing in? What do you like, mean? What's the difference between him not panicking and analyze the situation? He would still be in that room with no one to help him. Yeah. It, but he has more time to think about, well, maybe that doesn't help. Well, he has the time to psych himself up to do what he's got to do. Like... I guess okay, okay, okay. So, yeah. but would he? Would he? I think to get to the box to where the scalpel is, correct. He has that that to would trigger it. Yeah, pull the thing. Yeah, so yeah. yes, but he also got the, the he got the explanation of what he had to do before it jumped to the box, right? Yeah, yeah, that was on. So I, yeah. Ah, well, so so you're saying that if he just waited, heard the explanation, psyched himself up, and then ran to the box and quickly did it. Yeah. Right. Okay. Uh, so okay, so but that we did a we, round uh, route, but we never got to know if there was maybe there was uh, a special thing that was in place that if that ever happened, like uh, after five minutes, it still started anyway. Nah, but it's on a it's on a thing. That's that timer is it's a weight thing because you see the weight get pulled up when he moves forward. It's like it's a, it's a it's like a pin pulling a pin at a grenade. But this is the thing as well. It's like because it's a choice, he did it to himself. Um, which is Jigsaw's whole thing that like, oh, I didn't, you know, I, he says it in this film, like I've never murdered anyone. I always gave people a choice. Mm. He talks about how um, if he didn't actually like take the pin off to start the timer, then probably would just leave him there. Yeah, well, he would die. He would, he'd starve to death, as you've said, yeah. Yeah, like, so, yeah. The thing is, though, 60 seconds to realistically cut out your own eye, it's not a long time, is it? No, I mean, it's 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 
hyperbole, right? Also, like, to like dig around and find it, you've got to you've got to do that within the first ten to fifteen seconds. If you haven't made the cut in the first ten seconds, you you've finished because you're not going to do it in time. Just one thing: if you, when you're in your thinking about stuff, and if you wander your eyes towards camera right, uh, you'll your mouth will automatically be in the right position for the mic. That's why sometimes you look left and then uh, you're out of the. But oh, right. If you, yeah, the it's just because I feel really weird talking to you without looking at you. That's why. <laughs> um, mm. So mm. I'm always turning towards you guys, but okay. probably for podcast, yes, I'll, I'll learn that. <laughs> okay. Uh, there's a bit that uh, I know that you said uh, Adam is the best bit, uh, the uh. detective's uh, son answering machine. <laughs> oh, God, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, hopefully great. people are watching these films alongside us so we don't really need to um, tell you what happened in the film so we'll kind of talk about scene bits by bits and connect the story together um so we don't need to do a plot summary but yeah that whole <laughs> that whole bit where he is like i'm sorry he can't come to the phone right now really really good <laughs> what's his, his son what's his son's name again i've forgotten uh, daniel is it Daniel? Yes, I think you're right. Sorry, Daniel, I can't come to the phone right now. <laughs> if you'd like to leave a message. I think it was uh, cons- it was an assumed, well, it was um, well done on purpose, the fact that the parallel between the first film and the second, the fact that Amanda started on the floor unconscious. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so that you don't see that she's now in it. That, that's uh, Nuke's favourite thing is a dramatic reveal, and that's sort of a dramatic reveal for this film. That, oh, wait, why is Amanda back? Yeah, well, it's the dramatic reveal of the character, so it's fine. It's a dramatic reveal of actors that you have a problem with, right? Yeah, I don't, I don't <laughs> mind dramatic reveals of characters at all because I think that can be quite fun. It's just when it's like, you know, American and British cinema is all about realism, but then why are you dramatically revealing an actor? Mm. That doesn't make sense to me. Like, either this person is playing a character and you're supposed to believe it, or he's an actor playing a part. Which one do you want, America? <laughs> That's mm. true. Mm. Um, so, for example, um, the murder on, on the Orient Express, mm-hmm. the dramatic reveal of Johnny Depp. Oh, yeah. Uh, it's ridiculous. <laughs> this, that's just my feeling, anyway. <laughs> Thought too. <laughs> Uh, this film really doesn't, you know. But I remember mainly in the first one, we get the setup of like where we are. This is where the film will take place for the entire film. The the bathroom immediately, like the first fifteen minutes, is in that room. We don't really get to the main trap of this film until maybe like twenty to twenty five minutes into the film. I well, think I think it's at least fifteen to twenty five. Because it's I, I didn't recall that the this um, uh, escape room vibe was so early in the franchise. Like in in terms of multiple uh, rooms inside uh, uh, a thingy, which you didn't necessarily have in the first one. Well, I remember fa- it's number five is the big one that we talked about in comparison to Jigsaw because of the it, it borrowed the idea of five people in a, in a, a room. But realistically, Saw Two does the same thing when you think about it. And I think most people do kind of forget that fact. I'd forgotten that too because realistically the, the, it comes with a reveal. There's only about four, maybe, f- yeah, about four t- traps in this film. There's the Venus fly, needle pit, furnace, hand trap. Yeah, That's about four. They're all spaced in different rooms. Oh, yeah. and, the, and, yeah. the, and the, the stair with the SWAT team. <laughs> Ah, oh. The little booby trap in the stairs. Which, yeah, did it booby, did did it do that for all the SWAT team? No, just the first guys. Oh, so, okay, so why, so, why did the other people, were they just sleeping then? They were on the floor and they felt... No, they were dead. The two, they, From they, what? They got electrified with the, the cage. They right. Was, they got, mm. yeah. Okay, okay. And okay. the guy that got his leg damaged, it's not, I don't think they cut it off. I think it's like broken or something anyway. Okay, I missed the electrifying. Thing. I think the whole point was that it had... Um, it was like a pressure thing. So when he put both his feet on the one step, it broke in half and then something like swung into his shin. Yeah, like how it does in the jigsaw. Mm-hmm. You know, the, when he gets his foot cut on the wires. Yes, exactly. That's but the, great, yeah. but those are wires rather than something going inside your going yeah. into your leg. Oh, and there was also the, the first one, well, the, the second one, then the, the famous uh, do not use the key one. <laughs> yes, That's that is genius. <sighs> But I'd also because of the th- the way that um, uh, Jigsaw 
dealt with the f- in the, the two people in the in the first film mm. i feel like the audience is supposed to also scream with amanda and say no 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 no, no. follow the rules <laughs> like yeah. that's the way that you survive and so i thought that was quite clever because it was like um dramatic irony a lot of people have said in other podcasts and media about who opens a door while looking through the keyhole oh no because there's two people that's what i thought of this when i watched it because it does does xavier use the key on the door yes xavier uses the key and the guy the businessman he looks like a businessman um is looking through the keyhole so it's not like he's looking through the keyhole and turning, and the, turning the key it's two right. people using the door i've always thought it was just the guy doing it on his own mm. but no, no that's, that's, that's true well, that's quite true uh, i'll make a weird parallel now um you know amanda says because she deal she dealt with jigsaw before that he wants us to survive this yeah uh i think it's a bit like a casting director during an audition who wants <laughs> us to succeed so from now on just imagine john kramer's creepy smile when you're facing an audition panel should help that's not the line it's so true actually i think casting directors um well i mean maybe like really hot shot hollywood casting directors that they might put every single obstacle in front of you when you're in an audition but i feel like most casting directors that i've met um in the past two years have actually really wanted you to be good and they've shown like a kindness like don't worry take your time blah 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 like everything's really cool um, the only time that I found that is um, with drama school auditions. Oh yeah, is that they obviously make it really, really tough because they want to see how you act under pressure, how you act under scrutiny, blah blah blah. It's also to do with the fact that that's actually a, a team that is only hired for applications. Like most of the time, unless you get to like the final rounds, you won't interact with somebody that's part of the course. Like most of the people on the panel are part of an audition panel for drama school. Like they, that's what they do. That's their role. And mm. as yeah. a faculty, mm. that's interesting. And in for film and wh- whatever the audition room usually, they obviously they're rooting for you. You would be solving a problem that they've been given. Yeah. Oh, and it's so, so much cheaper to get the you than go through the whole thing. So uh, yeah, exactly. The but the ones you want to impress, and this is an advice to young actors out there, is always try and impress the casting assistant. Because casting assistants aren't going to be assistants forever. They're going to be the people that will be casting in maybe five, three to five years later. You know, they're the ones looking to like make those inroads early because it'll help them as they go further in their careers. Well, I I think it's also like, as we were saying in in Saw 1, that you are there for a whole project, right? So... If you're kind to everyone, treat everyone like a human being, um, you'll you'll go further because it's not about impressing that one top guy. Mm. It's it's about you're trying to make something as a whole, and you're there to do one job, but you acting isn't going to make the film. Like there are so many other people that are integral to that film. Yeah. So it's it's silly to think that oh I only need to impress this one person like actually like for example Tom Cruise one of the reasons why well they say that one of the reasons why he's so um popular is because he learns everyone's name on set yeah. and he remembers their name and he goes back to them and he's like oh yeah you uh Jan it was great working with it and Jan is you know working as a grip you know <laughs> yeah. like it's Jan's it's, a best boy yeah he knows Jan's name and he knows Adam's name while Adam is a hot shot suit while Jan is a grip like you're gonna get the most respect out of your team don't forget Dave on catering man catering is an underrated Dave, yes. Dave on catering I'm, t- I'm telling you right now catering is one of the most vital parts of any film set if you if you ha- are doing a ter- if you're having like trouble with technical like you can't get an effect to work and then you break for lunch and the the lunch is rubbish everyone's in a pissed off mood like yeah. the catering team are a super vital part of any production because if you're it, there's nothing worse than having a terrible meal i don't know if you guys have ever um worked in retail or like a service to someone else like I mean, like catering like yeah yeah like catering. like uh yeah but also just hospitality basically right um and how someone who's pissed off comes in to shop and treats you like shit and you've just ruined their day without even realizing oh, it. i've got a good story for that um my dad <laughs> my dad was working in a popular 
uh, supermarket and it was like Christmas time. So it was like they were, they used to give out like these big hamper things that you would pre-order them like way in advance and then you would get like say your, your Christmas stuff. So like parsnips, Brussels sprouts, turkey, you know, like a whole big thing, cranberry sauce, right? And somebody came back in that there wasn't any parsnips. I think it was either parsnips or carrots. And she looked, <laughs> she looked my dad in the eye and she went, you have ruined my daughter's Christmas because there wasn't the right things in the in the package and my yeah. dad's like what do you say to that like well there's not a I ha- you haven't i mean i'm pretty sure little sally wants a like you know a, a toy like anything else i'm pretty sure if she gets to the dinner table and there's no parsnip she's not gonna burst into tears well she might but also like that's kind of a great life lessons to learn right like you don't get everything you want honey when life doesn't have parsnips have carrots yeah like <laughs> jesus like don't that that's a crazy thing to say to someone and it's also it's not like it's his fault it's also my dad doesn't <laughs> like parsnips on a general basis so in his head he's probably going oh she's actually quite lucky that she doesn't have to eat parsnips mm-hmm. um but one, yeah yeah one final thing on audition i think uh it was a mirror or cat during your dinner part uh, birthday party and it's also a point in Andy Nyman's uh, Golden Rules for Acting, if you treat any audition as a chance to actually perform, do what you love, you yeah. d- and you d- care more about performing and doing your best more than actually getting the gig, you, you well, you should help a lot with the uh, after. That's how I treat it. I, I, I've given up, like, well, I'm not saying giving up. I'm like, I've, I've moved away mentally from going, like, I need to get this role because it's like and Mark told us a good story of somebody that used to got in the room with Ridley Scott and blew it because he was in a room with Ridley Scott. Like it got to him. Like you've just got to go in and go, I've got this opportunity. I've got to give it a go and try something. And if it works out, it works out. If it doesn't, there'll be other, cha- there'll be other chances. Yeah. It's like, it's like a bonus, right? It's like, if you get the job, that's, that's a bonus, but mm. actually use the audition to, do what you want to do which is why if you're doing it to be famous or to get money like don't get into acting because there's <laughs> no point uh, yeah you get, get into musically all, all those fears flying f- uh, failure every, everything that comes down. we were watching uh, eight days a week just earlier and i was wondering that while i was watching them they were just starting out if they well they felt like confident and really knowing what they were doing even though they were so young uh, in front of seven thousand people i was like wow i don't know if uh, I'd be curious to know what they were feeling on that level at the time. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, shall we talk about... Um, shall we talk about Obi... Do you want some water? No, no, fine. Um, new title. Shall we talk about Obi and the waste of two syringes? <laughs> <laughs> Obi, man. I said this when we watched it. Obi is an underrated and valued character of the Saw series. Like, I love Obi. He's, he's just so... He just so doesn't give any shit at all. It's just like, yeah, I did it. I kidnapped you. I'll go on and get them. Yeah. I mean, his his death, right, is is avoidable. Because surely, once you've been burnt, if you're in a situation where you're burning alive, getting a little more burnt isn't going to be any worse than being burnt alive. I, I don't know. I feel like this film okay so i think a ho- horror does that a lot like it, you start asking yourself like oh would i do that or oh that's a stupid thing to do or, oh my god that was so brave or that was so clever i would never have thought of doing that like obviously we don't know what we do because i've never been in a furnace <laughs> to hopefully get, to get a, a point a, you know an, an, an antidote that's another thing like <laughs> about antidotes right do I, if you if you're constantly breathing in a nerve agent, topical this actually being in Britain. Um, <laughs> oh God! Um, mm. If you inject yourself with the if, with the antidote, but then continue to breathe in the nerve agent, surely it doesn't like help because you're just layering it on top. Um, Do you think? No, because. Uh, well, well, I mean, your your body would start repelling it because obviously you've got the you've got the antibodies in to fight, and it's fighting off the the things that are killing you inside. But yeah, but it's like if you go to I don't know um, India for the first time, you have to take anti malaria tablets. Um, 
Oh, I don't know. Well, the, okay. Well, he's anti malaria. So, like, you get malaria. You've been breathing. You've been bitten by a mosquito that's carrying malaria. Well, you and then never you take know. and then you take the malaria tablet to deal with it. But then you can't keep getting bit by mosquitoes that carry malaria. Uh, yeah. Wait, uh, because the thing is that there are some stuff that you have to take in advance to prevent that thing. So that's yeah, different than the actual antidote that you actually have to consume it to so that you are actually saved from that all right stuff. what about what about venomous like scorpion or spider bite you get mm. bitten by one of them and then you take the antidote and then you get bitten again uh, that that's a good question uh, yeah that's a good question. that one works i don't think that well yeah i get yeah okay but that's kind of different because is it? No, maybe not. I don't know, but anyway, what I'm just saying is like the antidote thing is like I I, I assume it would it be they would survive they would not die but they would still be pretty ill. I th I think you need to get yeah. used to that because okay my my um dad was allergic to dogs and cats uh all his life right uh but when we were born and he decided to have dogs around he got some injections right so like uh, Basically, it's like uh, dog uh, hair, like well, but some some kind of stuff like yeah, like that. any any anti any antibiotic yeah uh, any uh, an, um, vaccination. Sorry, yeah, that uh, you get uh, a bit of that stuff that is dangerous uh, small in small doses, and mm. then you get mm. used to it. Mm. So that poison thing is a question. I have no yeah. idea. Uh, well, anyway, he does talk about how he, um, in three hours, the door opens, but you die in two. Yeah. So maybe it means that once you take the anic, they ha take the anic though. The the One antidote. time at this party. Yeah, once uh, once you take the antidote. Oh, I'm gonna have a problem with that one. <laughs> oh, I can feel it already. Um, once you take the antidote. It's all right. We edit the podcast. I can. We can take. We can get you saying antidote, and we can take out you saying anecdote. You know, it's antidote. okay. Antidote. Let's take the anic. Oh my god! Oh no! <laughs> oh, oh that's uh, brilliant! Dracula and Nosferatu. That yeah. wait a moment. <laughs> that's not. That's not a cock. <laughs> no, sorry, that's not a rooster. Um, okay. <laughs> yeah. Once you take the antidote, um, for the you know another for the rest of the time for two hours, you're fine until you can go to hospital. Right. Okay. I mean, uh, yeah, that, it, that was my theory, that yeah. it just kind of prevents it for another two hours, so until the door opens. We also don't know how long they... Well, we do. We'll see it later on in, I think, in sort of three or five or something. We see people... We see this the events before that test starts. Anyway, that's um, in the future. We'll or, see that. Or maybe that antidote actually gives you weapons to fight. Yeah, well, you're treated, but then you have the weapons to actually fight when it comes back. So you're actually safe. I don't know. I, yeah, yeah that's true. you become Spider-Man. Yeah, I, I did. Bi <laughs> I did biology in high school, but I, I, I have no idea. Yeah, me too. Uh, <laughs> but I don't. I don't know how that works. We all did. <laughs> we finally got an idea about what uh, John Kramer's motivations are. He says at some point, if I gave you the date and time of your own death. It would shatter your life entirely. So um, I think that John Kramer is a bit like Thanos. Uh, <laughs> All right. His reasoning makes sense uh, in his worldview, but the rest of the world thinks he's mad. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, well, it's, it's also like um, the villain in Black Panther. Oh, yeah, the Killmonger. Killmonger. Like, you, you can kind of understand where he got there, and it's actually a really interesting thing to say, and also to fight against. Like, of course, we should all live our lives like we're going to die at some point, but we don't, because we think, you know, like, I'm 26, I have another 50, 60 years left to live, so I don't really have to do work tomorrow, do I? because i've got 60 you know like that's the way that we live our lives but actually we should be like uh actually i'm gonna die in 60 years so i might as well do everything i want to do every mm. single day uh killmonger's thought process was that why is all the money and all the wealth and all the all, all the all the good heritage in one place when there are black people all over the world suffering mm. right and so it's like, yeah, I understand, but the way that you are doing it is wrong. It's a little bit like, you know, quite a lot of liberals at the moment. 
how they're doing shit right now yeah well it's yeah there's the, the you strip you of your free will and it's just like thanos like uh, yeah i know that it's like this so i'll just uh, remove half and i know that will work there was no worries i i exactly. said i said to my brother like a few weeks ago was like, yeah in, in a sense i can uh, i can see his point of view if i was in his shoes i would uh, probably say the, th- the, the same it was like well uh, no no he's just just like he's mad you remember yeah was the, yeah but you know it's just, it's just like um, john kramer he, if you had this kind of um, experience there, there is a a french movie about a guy who got diagnosed with cancer and he is not just like walter white actually he's not announcing that to anyone but his way of dealing it is making sure that he is being the worst asshole he can be to everyone he knows so he can live without anyone being sad mm. it's a very strong french oh. film yeah uh, that is so screwed up that that i that it wow i mean yeah okay so venturing back into the realms of the yeah plot. uh xavier the asshole <laughs> Oh my god. Xavier. Xavier. He sounds like a villain from the Power Rangers. And uh, the Needle Pit is one of Tobin Bell's uh, favorite uh, trap, actually. Well, we, before we just did this episode, I showed you two some behind the scenes stuff of how they made the, the, the Needle Pit scene. Um, oh, painstakingly. I mean, it's it's so intense, that scene, you know? It is. But I mean, that's all the actress, which is incredible. Yeah, Shawnee Look Smith is very is good in this film. She's really good, really good. Mm-hmm. I think she was good in the first one too. Like I believe her the uh, whole time. To get in that pit also in fo- uh, she's 4 months pregnant while shooting this is also very like yeah. admirable too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um Yeah, that, yeah, that we, we, uh, we saw in the documentary how they they treated the needles and everything it was fiber optic. <laughs> Yeah, and we, we have a personal connection to that specific trap, especially the way that uh, <laughs> they, they tried to open the door, didn't, don't, don't we? Yeah, I, um, in the escape room we did with Emma last year, um, at the very end, I dropped the key. Oh, did I drop the key or did I? I, didn't, I don't think I dropped it. I just couldn't get it to open the door. I couldn't open the door. I kept turning it the wrong way or something. Yeah, you took- I don't think I dropped it. I took, a, I took longer to do it, but I know what you mean. Yeah, it's, hey, when you get there, you're like, oh, Christ, which way do you go? Um, yeah, uh, well, let's talk. Uh, what do you think about the most efficient people in that movie? Uh, when John Kramer says at one point, the tech team's arrived. <laughs> the tech team. The tech team is on their way. It's like, how big is the city they live in? Or what? What? what's the tech team doing? Like, are they on a more important job? I so, know, like, this, this is a serial killer they're talking about. We've got John Kramer and there's a test going on. Get over here now. Yeah. It's like, um, wait a minute, we're actually rebooting the Wi-Fi in the... In the in the headquarters of the base, we'll be yeah. there in like twenty five minutes. I'm just finishing Tetris. Sorry. Well, <laughs> thinking about it, I was wondering uh, if it wasn't uh, big, like everything was happen- happening at the same time. But no, we we have a two hours countdown, so we know that it's in the course of two hours. Mm. Uh, because yeah, if every everything happens at the same time, the tech team, like you know, there's movie time and real time time. So <laughs> real time time. Yes. Uh, but we, yeah, obviously there is a two hours countdown, which was yeah. moving forward. It's interesting as well, because in hindsight, you realize that there's a timer because Daniel's oxygen tank is decreasing, right? That's no, the timer is for the safe to open. That's what that timer is. Yeah. So yeah. the safe that Daniel is in, when that timer hits zero, it will open and Daniel's there. So the test... Oh, so that's fine. The whole game, the whole game is because in the... So we'll establish now A and B plots we talked about briefly in the first film. The... Shall we establish what we believe A and B is? So we do A as the test subjects and B is the detective story? Uh Or shall we do that from now on? So every film we get to, A plot is traps, B B plot is detectives. Yeah. Yeah, it's fine. Yeah. Yeah. So the B plot, even though it's kind of presented as an A plot because of um donny Wahlberg's character eric matthews is is really the main test in the in the whole film um is for him just to sit and have a conversation with john kramer for two hours but john already knows that he's not going to do it because that's why the whole that's the whole way is to set up because john is this mastermind of human nature i guess yeah and he knows that um a police officer who's corrupt who plants evidence and manipulates and blackmails people to Mm. get them you know convicted 
um and also someone who has used um interrogative ways of getting their confession mm. um is not going to be a type of guy to be like okay yes mr serial killer i'm going to listen to you for two hours and i'm going to obey the rules because yeah. he's not a rule mm. rule obeyer i'm not a guy that obeys by the book mm. exactly. we're, we're, i throw the rule book away we still haven't reached the level where it's uh, confusing as hell. No, we're uh, not. <laughs> it's yeah. the, the, we, the poetics were shattered on this one. <laughs> it started because the B and um, the A and B plot were not uh, intercuts. Well, I mean, it was not that this, the, the 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 action didn't. Uh, well, there was a time difference basically. Mm. Mm -hmm. uh, it was, re and it's what is nice is like it, it, those are re like you get in heist movies, like recordings instead of live feed kind of stuff. Uh, but still, if I, I've seen that once or twice before, and still you still enjoy it uh, a oh, lot, yeah. you're still like, but why? Okay, so they are in the room, but uh, the uh, cop lady can't see that. What, what? So you, you know, but you still enjoy that whole uh, process. Yeah. Well, I believe that the, the A plot happens the day before they raid John's room. Because we see... Um, his er at the very start of the film, we see Donnie Wahlberg collecting his son from an electrical store that he's tried to shoplift from. Mm -hmm. And then he goes, I'm going back to stay with mom this weekend. And he disappears. It ha he never gets to the mom. Clearly, he never gets to the mother. So I yeah. think that the, the whole A plot happens the day before um, the B plot. Mm -hmm. uh, I agree. Um, which makes it even more like, because for years I always thought, it's like, has this just happened like a couple of hours before? Like they've just missed it? But no, it really, it really does seem by like even the sort of windows that we kind of see in the in the house that is dark, and they raid the um they raid John's room when it's daylight, even though that was weird because it was like seven, it was like half seven at night. I'm like, God, it must be like the middle of summer, like still light at half seven at night. Mm -hmm. but, summer. Yeah. So yeah, the the time time is gonna get even more confusing because we haven't even got to flashbacks yet. Like when we're jumping in and out between films, um, yeah, and also like um, there there isn't enough. Like it's only to film too, right? So there's <laughs> it's it's not like it can be overcomplicated yet. No. Um, yeah, I'm curious how the writing works because in some series, like when they want to add drama, they have. Uh, someone call there's a like an interrogation room and they have someone call and it, it seems important but no one wrote uh anything about what was said on the phone <laughs> they think about that in later episodes yeah i, I wonder what uh, uh the, just like the, the wakowski bros uh, brothers uh tried to, to sell us that they thought about the three uh matrixes uh right That's from the true. start yeah um, I'm I'm really cute because I have a feeling and the, it all makes yeah well you need to be focused and that's not the one that you go for five minutes to the toilets in the middle no. uh, especially in the later ones oh hell no um, but yeah I have the feeling there was a uh, really uh, many brain power in the writing rooms well, oh I think, yeah I think they got that they got the the license to do that when they realized how well the first film did like when they start seeing the big money because it made a huge it made like a hundred million i think in it yeah so that's like um it made a hundred times its budget back really pr pretty much yeah. um they had the ability to go right where do we want to where do you guys want to go with this and it's when we watch the next one it's clear because that's the, the final film that the two the original creators are involved with like they walk away from the table after part three mm -hmm. um so it's not, it's interesting to see what they came up with afterwards because obviously the first film is meant to just exist on its own and it can exist on its own because it was their own idea and they had it for a, like even, we don't know how long they had the idea for but that I mean, was a what few, they a few years, probably yeah. yeah so that's what they had and now they've gone okay we can kind of open up here and what what do we want to expand on well what's interesting is that um the uh, someone wrote this script and then it was called something else and was sent to producers and different people and, you know, big production companies. And then it's someone realized along the way that like um, the Saw guys, so Wanell and Juan, Juan? Juan? James Juan, yeah. Um, were on something else. 
So they, it's not like they could bring them on board, but they realized along the way that this could be Saw 2. Oh, that's interesting. I didn't know this. So it's, um, and then the, it's at some point got to Hoffman, who's the director, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, Gregory so. Hoffman, he's either a producer or a, he might come on later on as a director, but he might be on this one. I'm not yeah. too sure. Um, I'll check that out because they uh, go through so many directors. Uh, three names like something, something, Bozeman, I think. Right. Um, and then there's, so anyway, it was taken to Hoffman, who was on the film of the first one. And then um, he realized that, yeah, this can definitely be used as Saw 2. Um, so I don't think it was actually... No, he, Hoffman, is a, he becomes later on. It's currently directed by Darren Lee Bousman as the director of Saw 2. But Greg, Greg Hoffman is a producer. Right, so it was, it was taken to the producer of, of, of this film and then he decided, oh, actually, this could work as Saw 2. Right, okay. And then 1L and 1 were brought back to, like pretty much skim through it and see if they could change things oh so like there was never a plan to do saw 2 like from no like well from the two the guys that made the first one i well i think i think no i don't think so i don't think there was a plan from them but i do know that they probably had an idea to do saw 2 but they had no idea it's not like this this script started off as Saw 2. It started off as another film. And okay. then throughout the production s- sorting out, um, you know, like bringing it to meetings and all this kind of stuff. They figured, right, we could use this as Saw 2. Actually, this could work as Saw 2. And then they couldn't bring the, all the Saw 1 writers on board immediately because they were doing stuff on another film at that point. Right. But they used that script... And then they brought those two uh, as like freelance to be like, guys, can you like skim read this? And they put their little bits in, you know, two cents in. And right, then so they were like, start, oh, actually, this s- could be Saw 2. So you start adding like characters from you, like, start adding John Kramer and Amanda and so on and forth into the script and seeing, all right, how does this change it? Sort I of thing. think that that's what, ha- yeah, that's probably uh, what they brought in. Okay, that's interesting. Well, you'll never know how your stuff will be received and the success it will have. Like um, the very first season of Buffy the Vampire Slayer was just 10 episodes. They just filmed everything and they just uh, launched that out there. And it was massively popular, and then uh, six other seasons followed. Yeah. And uh, ju- some people higher up uh, noticed Joss Whedon, who did the script for the film, which was terrible. The film was just <laughs> terrible. Uh, but some people knew, and now, years and years later, he, uh, well, he's done his own stuff, but he went to do the Avengers and stuff. So, uh, mm. yeah. Nice. Yeah, yeah. He, again, he wrote the Alien uh, Resurrection script, which uh, is uh, like one it. black mark on his <laughs> resume, according to him, because I actually enjoyed the fourth one. Alien Resurrection, well, it's better than the third one, anyway. Yeah, yeah. That's why everyone enjoys it so much. <laughs> um, I'm always worried to go back after the first one to a film. There are so many, like, second and third films that I just haven't seen because I'm just worried it's going to ruin the whole thing for me. But It's interesting, Anouk, that you bring up that, that it wasn't always planned as Saw 2. So what do we think... What was the other film? What I aspects mean, of this do you think? Do you think it was the people... Obviously, I reckon the script might have had something about people being trapped in a, in a house and they went, oh, this could be Saw 2. Because it's the idea... Because the only thing that Saw had at the moment was... You had people trapped in a room and they couldn't get out and you had a guy making like traps and you had detectives trying to f- figure out a serial killer. That's the only real big things you have as a Saw movie at that time because we've only got Saw 1. Yeah, so it was only after the Hoffman and Bozeman they wanted to produce The Desperate. That's where the script started. Oh, um, right. So the producers were on to make that film and then they realized... They s- when they started having conversations about it, they were like, actually, this could be the script that we need for Saw 2. And then ah. they brought in 1L and 1 to use the Saw, you know, traps and... Oh, sorry. Um, the characters. Right, okay. In bringing it into the Saw universe. Um, but the traps and the deaths and the and certain characters are actually from the desperate script which was supposed to be produced 
as a one thing. Oh, okay. Nice. So that just goes to show how your script could be used for a franchise that wasn't even supposed to wasn't be a franchise. connected at all <laughs> as your... Th- oh, it's crazy. It's mm. funny because if they hadn't made that link, we would never get... Well, we might have had a completely different Saw series, actually. Um, you never know. It's yeah. crazy, yeah. yeah. Um, There's things happening at s- the right time. Two, eight, nine, sixteen, and so on. Uh, would you remember all those numbers? Absolutely not. <laughs> I'm good with lines because uh, obviously uh, that's what I do as an actor. Like I'm good with lines, I'm good with lyrics, I'm good with all of that. Numbers, not so much. I don't know why. Numbers, uh, I forget. Adam will actually tell you that I'm really good at remembering numbers because I'm usually the one that reminds you what the code is <laughs> if you're playing like Alien Isolation yeah, or like put, put any a ga- game. Yeah, any game that I need a code. I'm like, what was the code again? She's like, uh, oh, it was this. I'm like, how the hell do you remember that? Usually like four or five numbers I can I can remember. You remember them as numbers, like or yeah, yeah, okay. Because uh, one of the so you've got uh, memory championships and stuff, and you've got plenty of uh, methods to to learn numbers. Mostly is to like assign one uh, number, uh, an an image the the silliest possible, and and then if you have multiple numbers, like to to make transitions between those. But it it has to be. Uh, in countries, or, or yeah. else it takes five hours. Like, but yeah, or else it takes uh, way more time to actually think about those. But but once you when you have the hab- the habit to do that, uh, I used to know uh, uh, be able to learn a deck of cards, a uh, shuffled deck of cards, uh, and recite it after. Well, it was something that, but needs uh, training, and. Uh, but it's all about me making images in your brain, silly, huh. silly, the the most silly uh, images possible. Um, so with numbers, the numbers, Mason. It's actually what happens in my brain, and also this is natural, so this isn't going to help anyone. This is just the way my brain works. Is that I remember it being on screen, right? So the way that I had just seen it. it well, yeah, I guess so. Cool. Um. Which which is why when I'm learning lines, I'll highlight it because that actually helps me because uh, when I'm thinking back on a line, I remember me highlighting and that's how I remember it. Huh. Interesting. Nice. So so the way that I'd remember the line, uh, th- sorry, the numbers is I remember him going to each person and like t- uh, looking at the number on their neck. And I, that's how I remember it. I, I remember, I learn lines by remembering myself saying them. Mm. Which is, right. So it's like, a, it's like a loop that builds up. Like I can, so I, it's w- audio. Yeah, I'm, I've mm. always been, it's, that's probably actually because I grew up listening to audiobooks. Probably. So I'm so used to hearing stuff over and over and over again and it sinks into my mind. Possibly. It's the same with lyrics. That's how I remember lyrics completely because I can remember myself hearing the song and then yeah. saying the song and then it's a loop. It builds. Yeah. But that's just me. Yeah. Uh, my, mine is a bit more photographic, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm not that... G- well, with numbers, I need... Uh, if I'm focused and I'm actually enjoying what is happening. Well, uh, But la- for lines, yeah, it's way, way more photographic. Yeah. I test myself. You know what? Uh, uh, what uh, Mark said you shouldn't do if you're not used to it. Um, at the well, y- you read the line and then you repeat it in your head and then you hide it and test yourself. Mm. Which is, uh, if you know all the imagery methods and everything, which are faster and more efficient and more durable, uh, that one the testing is not the most the the best one. But uh, for me, it works. Yeah, I think as well. Like with with learning lines you have to have loads of different things right because Mm -hmm. you have to know them so well that you don't even think about it because then you have to think about what the other person is doing in the scene your the way the things that you have to do in the scene if you're holding something and then you have to think about like camera angles and blah blah blah. so if you're still thinking you can't obviously i can't like uh, do one thing if you're still thinking about lines there's no way you're batting no, exactly. You're, you're not there. You're you're somewhere else. Yeah. You're separated so. from the scene. Yeah. Um, you, yeah. No, sorry. I'm gone. There, there are just some. You wouldn't uh, think they are, but they are some gory, like when uh, and weird stuff. Also, when uh, Xavier is removing the back of his head <laughs> skin. <laughs> that scene is ridiculous. Yeah, and puts it in his pocket. He puts it in his pocket. Like I'm gonna keep this for later. 
I he doesn't even well. look at the number, I don't think. We don't see it. We never see it, no. I love as well, like, he doesn't write anyone else's uh, number, but that one he needs to keep in his pocket because that's the one he'll forget. Like, I, I don't understand well. that thought process. Um, <laughs> like, I th- but do you know what? That I feel like that was an act of panicking and not thinking what he'd do in the scene. I don't think he, uh, the director told him to do that. I think it was literally like the director didn't tell him what to do. And so he panicked and thought, okay, I'm just going to slip this in my pocket now because I, I have no think, idea what to do I with it. I don't think so because we have a separate shot of the pocket. No, we don't. Yeah, we do. No, he I takes don't. it off and then it's another shot of like his waist and he puts it in his pocket. Uh, no. I'm sure it is. I don't remember that shot, Adam. I don't remember it to be uh, two shots, but... Uh, yeah but it pans down even if it's not too short we get a distinct thing of him putting in his pocket yeah but it's 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 uh it's still his his core you see his core it's not like it's focused on his pocket so i feel like that it's not the director deciding okay we need a shot of him putting it in his pocket it's just that okay this is the shot and the actor just panicked and thought okay i'm not going to throw this away because that's going to look unprofessional i'm going to put it in my pocket because I don't know what I just don't know why the director would say, can you keep that piece of skin you just cut off your neck? I like that know. just feels like, that just looks like something that I would do as an actor, panicking. <laughs> I guess, I guess. I don't know what I would, honestly, I don't know what I would do if I, I would feel keep like it I would do throw cause it away. Throwing it away. So could I go back and pick it up later? Like, fuck, yeah. what was the number again? Oh yeah, this. I mean, it must oh. have taken some time to film that. I mean, if I was in that situation, by the way, this is how it would go for me. I'd go, right, it's eight, two, oh, fuck, and have to go back and look at somebody else's net. Like, just double check. Like, if they'd had, if he, obviously, then he doesn't get the knife until he, when, when does he get the knife? It's in, where do, where do we find the, the, the knife? Uh, it, he takes it from a body, I think, doesn't he? Or no, it's not. Body. It, it's from no, it's from the downstairs where Obi is. It's in the in the mannequins. That's where the knife is, because okay. uh. he threatens Obi with it earlier in the film to get in the yes to get in the furnace. That's when the girl breaks the bottle top and she's like, yeah. If you he, I, rec- I reckon if he had that knife from the beginning, i.e. like he kept that after the Obi's test, he would have cut off the neck pieces. But because he doesn't have it by that point, he just remembers them. I think that would have made more sense. Because it does feel like a left field. He cut, oh no. But then how cool is it to then take out 10 pieces of neck? Yeah, but you like, wouldn't that's forget. That's not going to look good out as a piece of film. Like, you, like, no one wants to watch that. And you want to keep it as a surprise when he does that to himself. That's also, that's probably <laughs> the why he doesn't do that. It's probably for the, the dramatic, oh my God, he's going to cut his own neck. He's uh, just hacking away. <laughs> like, oh, how are you doing that? Like, And also, would, if you miss the number, like, imagine you just cut it too short and you've only got, like, a tiny bit. Yeah. Like, it's, it's meant to be, it's either a five or a two. You're like, oh, shit, what is this? that's what i thought i was like what if you cut halfway through the thing it's like that could be a zero or it could be an eight it's like oh it's a six between the 10 and 20 (laughs) i I don't know i thought about the same thing at the time yes did you really yeah but yeah but you could see like the the cut was very obviously because it was silicon or whatever very large anyway so yeah it's massive (laughs) it was like a whole length of his Um, neck oh to go back to the the b plot yeah, the mm-hmm. B plot. Um, the whole, the best part of this film, I used to think was all the stuff with John, you know, talking to Jigsaw at the table. But I watched it again. I'm like, you know, the traps in this one are pretty good. I did enjoy the whole being in the house. I was like, I forgot how much it actually does work. Yeah, it does. It does work. Like, yeah. I think because the story is is actually quite complicated and intelligent. Like, so it, you actually are interested in what happens next. Mm. I do like how they don't spend a lot of time looking for him. Like, it's almost, they find, before we even get to the, almost like an inverse of the last film, the first 15 minutes is um, the B-plot as opposed to being in the room. It's finding Jigsaw after the events of the first film. Mm -hmm. Although we don't know how long it's been since Saw 1. That's never addressed. Well, yeah, I mean, because... Or it might be addressed later on. I guess you're supposed to think that it's a while because you see the bodies of Lawrence Gordon. Adam and Zip and then 
Dr. Gordon's foot. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. And that's like quite a de- decomposed body, no? Yeah, they become skeletons later on, I think. So <laughs> yes, they do. There's, they are skeletons by at least the final film when they, they ends with that. But um, but yeah, it's 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 still it must be at least a couple of months for sure. Um, there is something here. At the, okay, it's probably going to go deep in a few seconds. Um, there is one line in there. Um, the cure for death immortality right so there's something i've been wondering for years because i've been asked the questions a few times uh, by my brother i think actually okay we're living we're doing stuff we're we're podcasting right now we're having t- trying to get acting gigs uh but what because of the whole theme uh, here of not appreciating li- life enough and that kind of st- what and that kind of stuff um what would you say your your kind of I don't know end goal or why do you continue on uh, living? <laughs> oh what wow, m- that's deep for a saw podcast, isn't <laughs> Just it? Just kill yourself. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I mean like, what, what do, do I want? Wa- are you what, asking what no, do I want to be remembered for? That's yeah, it's what uh, be remembered. Uh, what you want to achieve? Uh, because you only get one shot anyway. So what do you want to be remembered for? Yeah, that's one the the last stuff uh, that I heard. Uh, yeah. I, one of the what my key. The goal period of my acting th- pyramid at the moment is to do something on in the national theatre stage. Um, that's one of my goals in life to get to that point. It doesn't matter what what role I am. I could be backstage doing something because you never know how your career is going to prog- progress. You know, they could end up doing you know a podcast at the national theatre. Like you end up, I end up producing or working on the national theatre podcast. That would that would be equally as cool. But just something involved in that in the national theatre. I think that's what I'm aiming for i think hopefully with acting but i don't mind how i get there i just like the whole creative vibe of the national theater um i yeah i i don't know if it's because of my age or if i'm always gonna think like this but i've always been quite selfish like i don't really want kids i i don't have this whole thing of like i want to be remembered in in the way that most people talk about it like no but i mean uh sorry to stop you there but mm. i mean remembered you could be remembered via having kids like okay you you right. like, yeah it, well, that's what uh, i mean that's i agree with you it's like i've never had that feeling of like ha- i need my seed to carry on or <laughs> you know this kind of thing and like i want to inherit uh have pass someone on a legacy. pass on thank you pass on certain things like so I have always been like, um, I'd like to be, well, okay. So I'd like to be remembered for just kind of carrying on. <laughs> like, not that sounds really depressing, but I just mean like uh, through all the shit pa- and the bad stuff, like pa- she carried on, like she kept going. Powering through. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like finding the good you want to be remembered for being strong, basically, right? I guess, yes. Yeah. But also just someone that Didn't give finds up. the good in everything, mm. which I try and do. Like, I fail all the time. But yeah, but you tr- you make your situation work for you. If, if you fail at one aspect, you'll come back and try again at another angle, that sort of thing. Yeah, and it might take me a while to get there, but I always, at some mm. w- way, get to that point. On a selfish note, I want to perform with um, RSC. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Like, um, that's my, that's my, on top of my goal pyramid, RSC I, I prob- or at least like a rep theater. The I should probably, a- uh, sorry, I should probably answer how you answered as well. Cause I kind of did a goal one as well. Um, remembered, I, c- I, I don't know. I, if honestly in aspects to this podcast, if we had one person listen to this and got somebody to watch a film that they didn't really think they were going to watch or have an opinion about something about film or got into film because of listening to these, I think that's quite something to be remembered by, you know? creating something that encourages other people to get invested in film is quite is quite an achievement uh that that would be quite nice and i've always thought that you know when you listen to something or you watch something and you think oh that person is great and or or for example like you might i don't know write an email to someone saying that you inspired me or i don't know you write a review and it's like a good review um 
that you always want to be that i've always thought i'd love to be that person mm. that like yeah inspires someone in a way i mean look at us like, we started this with like the idea that uh, nobody will listen to this and we're doing pretty well so you know well, oh, yeah what you just said it was uh what i was saying that was my uh reason for doing stuff uh um, that you would at some point have someone who could come and say, yeah, you inspired me in some way. Uh, but now, because my brother has been asking me that question for five years or something, <laughs> and which is uh, kind of funny because I just asked you like five minutes ago and you came up with plenty of stuff. I'm still confused. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I That's just thinking on the spot though, like, oh, we've got to have something. Have I sat down and thought about it? Like the questionnaire, like... Our answers on the questionnaire, I probably would say completely different answers now than what we did on the day, because we're just like, uh, what? Mm. <laughs> right, right, right. But yeah, no, the thing is that, um, yeah, I think the last time you asked me that is three years ago when I was depressed on a um, um, female reasons at the mm -hmm. time. And well, yeah, I kind of powered through. When it was hard, but uh, when I have... It's not like escaping, but yeah, I, I now, now I reframe thanks to inner game. Actually, uh, I mm -hmm. won't be great uh, grateful enough for that inner game thing that I discovered two years ago. Mm. Mm -hmm. uh, reframing and uh, having powerful images to replace the bad yeah. stuff when that happens. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's mostly worked for me the inner game with past stuff, not necessarily with future stuff. I need to work on that still. Mm -hmm. mm. Um, but yeah, I, um, what I want to me, I, I can't, I, I really, well, I'm you've not sure. You've achieved one of your goals that you wanted to do. I mean, three years ago, could you imagine being on the stage doing Polonius, <laughs> you know, at, at the Edinburgh Fringe? I mean, that's you've, super brave. So Jesus. you've done something, you know, like there's always, you've always got that. Yeah, 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 yeah. That what I mean is, I, I'm not sure what I mean really, but, uh, <laughs> is that, yeah, there was this acting. Well, uh, I'm kind of glad that stuff happened three years ago that made me completely change, uh, and that in all this like um, uh, snowball effect that I'm now here uh, where I'm today. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, because this acting thing, I was uh, was so there was I was at the school then the, the navy because I didn't know what to do with my life, and then when the the, the navy uh, was became annoying and stuff, so <laughs> I. I worked at the vineyard for a year and then had this uh, thing, which uh, also, again, uh, I'm happy that uh, I, uh, Paul knows uh, Mark Westbrook, uh, which was a little touches, links, and like uh, the chain um, bits that uh, makes it that I'm here uh, today again. Um, but yeah. It's, uh, it's funny how we're all here out of mishap. Like something else went wrong and we ended up in Glasgow. <laughs> like I, I, I auditioned for drama school and all my other friends were going off to uni and stuff and I, I didn't want to do that and I was, I was like I don't want to be trapped in Dunfermline forever and I got lucky that the it was the second year I applied for drama school after being at high school, um, having been at ACS for like two years. Mark went, oh, I'm doing, I'm finally doing the full year course. So I'm, I applied for that and I got lucky to get on that. Yeah, and you you discussed before about how you you left the navy and you, the on the vineyard and then with Paul you ended up in Glasgow, and in Anouk you you know you're you're I don't know if you told the story that you were at you did a year you were in a year for an acting course and you stopped, mm -hmm. and then you needed to get out of London, yeah, and then you ended up here, yeah, and because of all three of these mishaps we're now here recording episodes of a podcast that we never knew that was going to be if anyone would listen or not. So life really, you can't plan life because the best opportunities you get come out of mishap, really, I think. Oh, definitely. The way you deal with not going the way you want to go always usually pans off for the better, you know? Definitely. Um, I, I mean, don't go John Kramer. No, don't go John Kramer. Uh, uh, or Thanos. Or yeah. Thanos. <laughs> no, but the, the times when stuff happened and eventually turned out good was when you, it, as always in life, turn down your guard. Yeah, true. Yeah. yeah. And it hurts on w if it doesn't work on the day. But then, yeah, today it's, uh, it's all kind of sort of uh, fine. <laughs> I yeah, because you learn from it and then you're a stronger person, which yeah. makes you a better person. And then you're more likely to like take risks and do 
kind of crazy things like start a podcast <laughs> and move to Glasgow and you know like to me Glasgow was such a random place like <laughs> I had no idea you know Scotland I didn't even think about I'm sure Jan felt the same yeah like who ever thought that I'd live in Glasgow of all fucking places <laughs> the, the only Scottish uh, idea I had uh, told that already a few times were uh, Highlander and Braveheart so you know uh, yeah <laughs> I mean your whole life has been verging on to towards Scotland yeah, right? <laughs> yeah and Jan really is Christopher Lambert uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah uh, I forgot to talk about um in Hereditary, and it happened here also. One of the SWAT guys with a what? Oh yeah, that was great. That was so funny. Real reactions in Hereditary, yeah, with the the sales. The uh, journey yeah. was like mm. <laughs> what? I need to stop. Th- what? I'm talking to my son. <laughs> it's like the the old keep the old professor, not the professor, like the sightseer in um, Holy Grail, like on the on the bridge, going what? Is your name? <laughs> so my so um so Lancelot the Brave, what? Is your favourite colour? Blue. What? And it's also the Alright, off you go then. And it's like, what? That's easy, and then this guy goes up, he's like, What? The, like what's are great. Yeah. There's also the one with David Tennant when the Titanic enters the TARDIS like oh, what? Yeah. Yeah. what? 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 Oh, like three yeah. I um, remember that. Are we um, ready to go? There's a couple of more things I want to bring up. Yep. A1 is uh, to come back to the SWAT team, right? The SWAT team are useless because the only thing they turn up and do, they turn up with 15 minutes to go of the film, not the time limit of the, the game, I think. Um, uh, the tech team? Yeah, the tech team. Okay. The tech team then can't detect that the feed they are watching is from a TV in another building. They can only detect where the TV is coming from. I, I mean, They can't go, wait a minute, this isn't a live feed. Like, what tech team is this? I know. If the FBI and the... And I was about to say CSI. And <laughs> the EIEIO. The FBI and the CII. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I, I, I thought the about... The CSI and then the CIA. CIA. The CIA. <laughs> <laughs> you know when the CSI guys... The CSI and the FBI meet up and t- team up against the CIA. It's an EIEIO. <laughs> Hey, you. Old MacDonald. <laughs> Old MacDonald had a CIA. E-I-E-I-O. <laughs> if the FBI and the CIA have a tech team like that, they should fire them immediately. Well, that's it, that's no, all I wanted to say. The, the CSI team are going, enhanced. Enhanced. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's, I'm enhancing uh, the image. I'm rotating 75 degrees to look at it at a different The velocity angle. of the flag. <laughs> can, no, we get, can we get an... Enha- oh, no, the other one is like, can we reflect... Can we get the reflection in the person's eye? We can, see, <laughs> we, can see the, we can see the bagel sign in the window. That's how we know he's on 7th Avenue. No, but that, that's a technicality. But if the feed is going out, you can't... Like, I mean, um, anyone except the fact that we re-air episodes. So I write, like, uh, when we aired again the Nosferatu episode as if it was live... No, obviously people will know because uh, I said like, okay, this is just a re-air thing. But if you get some stuff out, you have not. Well, I don't think you have any way to know that it was uh, recorded or live stuff, okay. except if it says live. I guess so. I don't know, but yeah, the time I that f- you just feel like uh, feel a tech team would know what was outgoing, ingoing. Like if it was live, surely there'd be like a feed that they could. I but mean, maybe in 2005, maybe not, but... Yeah, That's yeah, but th- they get the feed. It's just that the actual source of the feed in the house... Well, anyway, um, what was your other point? Adam? The other point, I'm just trying to remember. Oh, yeah, I have... Um, the one thing that annoys me is I know it's there for the twist that we end up in the, the, the bathroom again. I'm like, so we're now meant to believe that that bathroom was below that house that they were in. You know, like that is connected to that house. Mm-hmm. Unless they were running down that corridor for like three miles or whatever, because I'm like that. I don't. I don't know if I buy that. That yeah. that house is was over the the bathroom because I'm like, why was that bathroom there? Yeah, they wanted to do some fan service for sure. Of course, but, it, it, it does seem a bit strange. I'm like, why would there be a house above this bathroom? But that's just me nitpicking, I guess. But then again, it could have been just like constructed by Jigsaw himself. Yeah, maybe it's like a. a 
Yeah. It's like I a guess. torture house room. I don't thing. think he built that. I think it's like maybe if they were like working on the sewers or underground stuff and it's like just an extra like bathroom and stuff for workers or something like that. Right, but like a pretty how, grotty room. Like how in Jigsaw uh she talks about oh, this is a farm that was leased to Jigsaw's ex wife who oh, then have. is the <laughs> we haven't even because got she's to dead. Jill yet. Blah blah blah. Yeah. So we haven't even got to Jill yet. Oh god. I mean this will come later, but I think it's yeah. four that Jill turns up. Yeah, Adam hates her. I I kind of agree. It's just no, it's just the character is terrible. Anyway, yeah. um, what was the other point? The other point was how is there two houses that look identical? I know houses like I've seen places on on right guard right guard <laughs> the deodorant that right move the website of like houses that has like similar layouts to what our flat is, but the flat that the tech team the SWAT team get to is identical to the room that they were because that's the same isn't that the whole thing? Isn't uh, that that's the whole the thing same, that it's the same house? But before or after? No, so the tech team leave at the same time as Matthew leaves. And Matthews goes to another house. So the tech team go. It's another house. It's, the game was never played in the room where the, the SWAT team go. That's a completely different house. Oh, so the SWAT team go to a different house, but Ma- Matthew goes... To the right house to, where sorry, the game Detective was. Detective Matthews goes to the house where the game was, but um, like an hour later. Yeah, like a different time from when the game was played. But the yeah. SWAT team never arrive at the, where the traps are. They arrive at a completely yeah. different house. Yeah. So, I mean, Jigsaw's been busy. What do you want? <laughs> it's just like the two houses look identical the same. I'm like, what? Uh, well, maybe not identical, but it kind of. Well, uh, well similar the, enough. Like uh, the same staircases and the same like. Uh, that flat uh, we're in right now is kind of practically the same that the one I was with PJ in like uh, two years ago. So. I mean, yeah. I guess. Yeah. I guess. Uh, maybe I'm just being a bit mean. But, but it's like a farmhouse. So I'll, it's like a, exactly E-I-E-I-O. the same. <laughs> C I C I A. Yeah, but when the the SWAT team opened the door, I was trying to look if there was the exit. It's again. not there. It's, it's not, not there. there no, yeah. it's ah. a different house. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's Very right. Very right. cool. Eagle eyed. <laughs> Eagle eyed. Yeah, you should be. Oh, that's the two things we haven't mentioned are the the what will eventually be the wheels coming off the bus for the Saw series that um, Carrie Elways is Doctor Lawrence is alluded to in this film. Being yes. the guy that does the surgeries uh, from all of the subjects because there's no way that John can. I mean, it's, it's it, we will see how John ma- is able to make the traps very soon. Um, but because of the lawsuit that Kerry always put, uh, filed for with regards to not receiving payment he believed he was entitled to or agreed upon, uh, I will link an article that describes it because I'm not reading articles anymore after the Ghostbusters gate. Um, <laughs> uh, Carrie Elwes is done with the Saw series. He's like, I'm not coming back. And ultimately, that will be the the one of the major flaws on this series is too many characters are introduced to cover up for we kind of needed Carrie Elwes as Dr. Gordon because mm. he was from Saw 1. It would make the most sense. Yeah. Uh, that was one thing I wanted to mention. Yeah, that's um, interesting because now, um, yeah, that's a yeah, good point. Because yeah. you see the, the tape when it's like the guy hobbling to like at the table, which is obviously because Dr. Gordon has one leg now. Well, an, an artificial foot. And the other point is that there's a fan theory that is born from this film, which will be blown apart by the next film, but the fan theory was that Adam is still alive uh, because the body on the floor, the bullet mark is in the wrong place. So in the I in, mean, I in really Salt, hope that there isn't a Saw 8 and there's Adam as a 50-year-old man. Well, that's the thing. We'll <laughs> get into it when we talk about Saw 7, but obviously Saw 7 is an amalgamation of two films. Um, so we'll talk about stuff like that at the end but yeah. that's the other major thing that we should probably have alluded to that oh and of course the, the twist we haven't talked about the twist yet yeah there may be like the script uh, person I, because uh, yeah we haven't indeed but um, it was obviously not filmed at the same it's, the story continues but it's two different sets like they knew that like, uh, rotting people are completely different like they remade the whole thing so that happens to have the thing in the wrong side yeah so it's, it's probably a continuity flaw and that's why people were like oh wait that's, he's alive it's more cryptic it's it's more it's probably more plausible that the t- production team forgot where he was shot and didn't have time to think about it and go back and watch the first film. Mm-hmm. And so they just put a gunshot at some place on his body. Yeah. 
Mm. So, um, so yeah, yeah, twist, game over. Game over, Shawnee Smith. It's it's Amanda. So I'm trying to work out because there will be a point in this series where the cheat the twist will just be cheap, and we're like, oh come on. Um, yeah. I'm thinking I'm looking at you, Saw Six. <laughs> I mean, um, when we get there, you'll see why. Uh, so the I the I watched it this time, knowing the twist, obviously, and going, is there any hints to that Amanda is not is in on the game? There is one big one that I don't. I wonder if you two guys have spot. So I'm going to see if you could figure it out. Do you did you spot anything that clues you into Amanda is in, in on the game? Yeah. Uh, Which is, some, what do you think? Some it is? ways she was looking at people sometimes. Mm. That. Oh. I thought it's she. She never coughs up blood at all. She never. She never seems to deteriorate. Her or Daniel actually. None of them look like they're getting worse. I mean, he gets like a little paler near the end, obviously, but she is fine. Yes. She never coughs up blood at all. I think that's explained yeah. in three or four. That's true. Yeah. What happens? But the reason for that. But she doesn't cough up blood. And with that in mind, then the only the only people that needed to get antidotes is the banker Xavier, uh, Obi, the woman who gets her fan stuck in the box trap. Oh, that's funny as well. The box trap. Why on earth? No, nobody in the game plays by the rules. Like they never pay attention to the tape. Obi doesn't look for the thing to twist. He just like tries to get out the door. Xavier just throws Amanda in the pit to do it for him. Uh, I can't remember her name. The blonde girl? No. The, not the blonde. Uh, the the, the f- trap. Hand trap. She doesn't even play the tape. She just like puts her hand straight in immediately. Yeah, she uh, she just... Uh, throws it. Throws it I'm, I'm going to get it. So there's only like five people that need to get onto those. Yeah, she only saw the needle, actually. She said, oh, needle, and let's go. Yeah. Well, <laughs> that's not how it but works. Yeah, that was the other thing I was going to mention. Do you, do, you, do you believe the twist for Amanda? Does it work, do you think? Yeah, I quite like it. Um, yeah, it has the uh, ash aspect a bit. Oh, from me, yeah, the android is in on it sort of vibe. Yeah, I get that. The thing is, as well, that this film is slowly building the idea of the cult of Jigsaw. Like he gets people that once he saves them, they become besotted with him. Oh, and there is Stockholm syndrome sort of thing. There is a pig again here, and it's not explained yet, but uh, apparently it's coming, right? It is coming. (laughs) It is coming. Yes, I think it's four. We get the the pig mask explanation. Mm. Um, Emmanuel Vogier. What's her What's her character name? Emmanuel. Oh, Emmanuel. Nice. Her actual name is Addison Corday. Emmanuel. Oh, it's on the. T- I think it's on the cassette. It is on the the thing. I I do remember that. But yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry, I'm sorry. Her name is Addison in the film. All oh, right. Okay. Sorry, I misunderstood. Mm-hmm. Okay. But that's um, about. That was the only other things I had to bring up. The now. Cool. We're an hour and fifteen minutes. That's not too that's much. That's not too bad. Uh, um, bad. Uh, rating. Yeah. Sure. So Anuk Yan was saw two good, bad, or just plain standard. Anuk. Um, I think this film was good, um, and I want a flair, but I don't know what it is yet. Should I go over to Jan? What yeah, I'm going to think about this one. Jan? Uh, I would say that uh, Aristotle would be annoyed by the shattering of the, uni- <laughs> of the unity of time, but um, still, it was good. Mm-hmm. Excellent. And Nick, you had a thought, do you want me to go for one? Um, I guess kind of calm before the storm. <laughs> calm before the storm. Yeah. yeah, I still say it's good. I don't think I'll have a flair. I don't think it, it needs one. I think, I think it's it, obviously it's it's a. Is it a good follow up to the first one? Uh, yes and no. It's not really. If you what you liked about the first one is the whole psychological thriller aspect of being trapped in the room and getting out. I don't think that really exists here because there's no. It's never really implied in the in the a plot that they can get out before the time. They just have to get antidotes. Which is a bit of a shame, but I, that's what they're going for, and it it's, it works fine. But for me, it's still good. It's still good. And with that in mind, Anuk yeah. Yan, would you, are you would you continue to the next one after seeing this one? Y- yes, but I'd be worried. Like I'm but, worried. But are you worried because you have fears about sequels? No, or are because you worried? I, well, yes, yes, yes. Or I'm worried because I usually worry about. Th- if not the second one, definitely the third one. I'm worried. Right. Okay. Fair enough. Um, yeah. Well, it ends with John Kramer in the van with a cheeky smile on his face. So you know he's up to some other stuff. So yeah, I would like to know what's coming. What he's up to? Yeah. Me too. I'm the same. I'm still carrying on 
with this series. So yeah, there we go. That was Saw 2. Okay. Um, so we were Adam, Anouk, and Jan. Bye-bye. Bye bye. Bye. Bye guys. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Good, the Bad, and the Just Plain Standard podcast. If you like what you heard, you can leave us a review via iTunes. If you want to keep up to date with what we're doing, you can check us out on Facebook and Instagram at Good Bad Standard Podcast on both platforms. If you fancy seeing the live streams that we talk about on the podcast, they can be found on YouTube.com. You search for Milk in a Wine Glass. There are other bits and bobs on there too, just to see what Jan's up to during the week. And if you really like us, like really, really like us, why don't you head on over to patreon.com slash goodbadstandardpodcast and have a look if you want to support us. Any small donation is appreciated.